Were you sabotaging yourself by being resistant to the sales and the growth and the things you needed to do in that business? Yeah. In order to essentially have the, I suppose, the suffering of then having to go back to employment. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because, because you know, at some level, most of us have some version of, I'm not enough. Some version of, I'm not smart enough, good enough, old enough, young enough, skinny enough, whatever it may be playing it's part of the human condition <clears throat> and i and and my version of not enough at that time was i'm not capable of being a successful business person welcome to beyond the fail the podcast where we talk to leaders and entrepreneurs about their biggest business failures we'll deep dive into how they overcame these setbacks the lessons they learned from them all to help you gain valuable insights Failure is an essential part of the business journey, as well as being the key to success. So we're here to show you how to thrive from it. On today's episode, we have Jeanette Anderson, a business development expert with almost four decades of launching, leading, and mentoring over 250 businesses. She has been a corporate trainer, taught marketing and entrepreneurship for universities and college, worked in sales roles for large companies, including Canadian Fortune 500 company and at one of those companies even made the largest ever sale in the company's history, a story which she shares in today's podcast. She also has two podcasts of her own and is the founder of Bodacity, a community and movement supporting women entrepreneurs to create bold businesses and lead bold lives. She's also created four businesses of our own in the events and marketing space and in today's episode she shares the struggles of growing those businesses due to her limiting beliefs eventually having to close them down she also shares some harrowing stories of childhood trauma being surrounded by addiction and violence and the impact that this has had on her approach to business including the fear of bringing on staff and business partners this really is a captivating and deep conversation with an entrepreneur who's been through so much and is now thriving. And I particularly enjoyed this conversation. So I hope you do too. This is Beyond the Fail with Jeanette Anderson. Jeanette, welcome to Beyond the Fail. Thanks for being here. How are you today? I'm awesome. Thank you for having me here, Jess. Perfect. Well, thank you for, for being here all the way from um, Orlando. Very jealous of the weather there. So, um, to, to take us back, where did it all start for you in business? <laughs> well, you know, my story probably goes back a little before a lot of people. Um, it goes back to when I was five and I really wanted the book Heidi. I grew up with lots of drama and trauma and violence and alcoholism and all of the isms and, um, books became my refuge. And I really wanted that book for some reason. I don't know why. Begged my mother over and over and over. Can we get it now? How about now? How about now? Finally, she turned around one day and yelled at me and said, no, we can't afford it. And I was really shocked, Jez, not by her saying that, because I heard that a lot growing up, but by the look on her face of, of shame and sadness and anger and frustration. And I remember, I don't remember much of my childhood, but I remember that moment so viscerally, like I can feel it now in every part of me, the decision to never want to see that look on another person's face and and it still is my why the my why is to support people in having a yes life not a no life and so kids we don't complicate stuff so problem no money solution get money and so i decided i was going to have a business my very first business and i decided to have a garage sale i'd seen the some people in our housing tenement do that so one day when mom was off at work, I hauled everything I could out, priced it. I came out of the womb pretty entrepreneurial. I could count money before I could read or talk and um, uh, had a successful yard sale. I was so proud when she came home. I was like, look, mom, $13.72. I can't remember what I had for lunch yesterday, but I still remember how much money I made that day. And problem solution, right? But she didn't quite see it that way. She was not so impressed. She... Um, cause I'd sold lots of household knickknacks and small appliances, pretty much whatever I could carry. Um, and my toys and stuff, 
Um, so the short version of the story is I got spanked. She took my money. I had to go back, buy back whatever I could. The adults sold us back our stuff, the stuff, but the kids wouldn't sell me back my toys. So I lost most of my toys and I didn't get the book, at least not for a while. She did relent later and got it for me. But so many people would say that wasn't a very good first business experience, but I think it was because I learned two really important things. One is don't go into business with family. <laughs> I'm kind of kidding, but not really. Um, <laughs> second thing is um, that we can take our destiny into our own hands using business as a vehicle to help us be, do, and have what we want. And so that was the first of many businesses I had. Uh, my first franchise was lemonade stand that I got other kids involved in. My first business was a daycare that I was 11 and I, my first employee was the nine-year-old I used to babysit. Uh, we did this little daycare in our tenement all summer. So I've had lots of different businesses, but four real official ones since I've been an adult, all in the realm of marketing strategy, business development, business growth, working with entrepreneurs. So I started young, I've been entrepreneurial my whole life, and I still think it's the best thing since sliced bread for supporting people and figuring out how to profit from living their purpose. I know it's a long answer, but that's my no, that's fantastic. start in business was then. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you started young, you've got that classic uh, childhood story of, um, of, you know, selling sweets uh, or selling yeah. uh, items that you didn't have permission to sell, basically. Yeah. Um, which is, uh, as you say, an interesting first business lesson. <laughs> I, I suppose just a, a, a few kind of follow-up questions. You mentioned about your mum's face. Describe that face to us. What? what I mean, what? Because it, it obviously has had a powerful yeah effect on you. Yeah, and I'm so I'm just trying to that. You've obviously taken a look in someone's face and then put it into a feeling. So what did it look like and what feeling has it given you to then thrust you into a life of kind of entrepreneurship? Yeah, it it really is that combination of shame and frustration of not having the ability to say yes to something as simple as a book that might have cost a dollar, maybe. And and I think beyond that, it's just really the the sadness around not being able to do for your children what you want to do or for anyone that you love or even for yourself and i think that that limitation that sense of limitation goes beyond just what we can buy with money there it becomes it becomes a way of life to say no to opportunities and options and so seeing her that frustrated seeing her that angry and sad Again, it wasn't new, but it was, um, there was just a, a a real resonance in that moment around that, that I, I impacted me deeply. And I, and I think that the biggest part of it was that it was for something so simple and small, and she just seemed so powerless. And it was the powerlessness that I didn't want for her or me or anyone else. And especially it was just really combined with that sense of, but this shouldn't be that hard. This, sh it, this is really fairly simple problem solution, you know, in that simplistic child way of looking at things. And really, that's still true. It's just that we make it really complicated. And all those limiting beliefs get in there and all of the stuff that creates all of the obstacles and, and resistance and fear and doubts and insecurities and stuff that really are the thing that get in the way. It's most, most of the time, it's not the practical external reality. It's mostly the, all of that inner, inner noise. And how old were you at the time? Uh, almost six, five going on six. I'm a little bit, you know, staggered by that. That 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 is a. To, firstly, to be able to describe it in, in those terms, mm -hmm. with such uh, vividness, uh, you know, uh, when you were so young. Is very, uh, kind of yeah, staggering, but also the fact that it's had such a big impact on you. But I would also say. That, it's a 
did you have that understanding of what that was like at the time or is it is it years of reflecting on it because you've used like the word you know shame frustration powerlessness all of which are very adult yeah. uh feelings and emotions yeah. And I'm like, that is one mature six-year-old. Yeah. I think. <laughs> well, it was a combination. I was very, uh, I became the mother at about four or five. I started taking care of my mom because she was quite dysfunctional. Um, grew up with lots of violence and, and so on. Um, mostly from, my mom was married five times. Four of the husbands were very violent and others were before I was eight. Um, lots of different kinds of challenges and issues. So I did become very mature very fast. However, a lot of that is hindsight reflection and mm. especially the understanding of the the kinds of, of feelings that she was going through at the time. What I do remember, like that little girl thinking was just a big no, that's not okay. That, you know, that kind of feeling of this like shouldn't be this hard. And not necessary, and and really that whole. I think kids often want to take away their parents' pain, especially when they grow up with a lot of challenges and so forth. And I remember thinking, I didn't want her to feel that way. I didn't want to to see that look. Um, you know, did I understand all of the dynamics and what was going on and so forth and so on? No, that was hindsight as an adult. Um, but I do remember really going, no, that's just not okay. And I also was very frustrated because I'm a pretty determined little Aries child that uh, no, it wasn't okay to get a no. I wanted that damn book. <laughs> and so yeah. <laughs> that was part two is I was also very personally motivated and, um, you know, it's like, no, it's not okay on a bunch of fronts. <laughs> so you went out and started, you know, yep. your first business in order to fund that book. Exactly. Um, Exactly. And I did eventually get it, by the way, because there's lots of people who are concerned. And it actually still remains my favorite book to this day. All right. So it's a bit of a classic, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Where did that drive to become an entrepreneur come from? You mentioned about being able to count money before you can read. Is Was that the the circumstances you were kind of grow, growing up in? Was that a, sort of the, the, the influence of, of that? Yeah. I think so. A lot of it, for sure. Um, I mean, you know, I'm not sure how much of it was genetic versus because no one else in my family is entrepreneurial. Uh, I've often thought, though, that I was like dropped off by aliens to my family because I don't really relate to any of them. But um, um, a lot of it was out of necessity. Like we we literally, you know, growing up, we sometimes didn't have food. So I got to the point where I would, you know, when we did have some, I would store some away for later. And, and so, um, or, you know, various different situations where we'd have to move because we're escaping from some man or something like that. There was a lot of that kind of thing growing up and a lot of, um, just, I became responsible for my mom because if she didn't survive, then neither would I, like I had to take care of her so that I would be okay. And, you know, as a child, do you think that all through? No, you just know that that person needs to be okay or else you're screwed. <laughs> so, so a lot of it was learning to take care of my mom and um, working early because we didn't have money. So, for instance, I started working in a, well, it was really, it was a lounge, bar, lounge, restaurant, um, that at 12, even though it was illegal, but I looked older. I looked like I was 16. And I think I, I think we told them I was 16. But so that I could start making money to be able to buy my own school books and clothes and stuff because we just didn't have the money. So it was either I I did it or else we didn't have it, right? And so, yeah, it was necessity. It was an innate kind of resilience that I was born with. It was a survival mechanism that got ingrained um, from all of the stuff that I grew up with. And that combination, plus the real, you know, kind of early experience with business being a, the solution, uh, made me really, really passionate about 
that that direction about using business as a way to solve problems, to express ourselves, to to create the lives that we want, the yes lives. Because I've done my time in in employment. It's not my favorite thing. <laughs> it's not a very good way to be who you want to be and get. And and yeah, I'm just not employable. <laughs> so I think one question that came out of that was, and we've kind of I've discussed it before in this podcast a little bit, uh, as to where entrepreneurial motives come from. Is it? And you kind of touched on it a little bit yourself. Whether it, you know, whether it's you're born with it or whether it's kind of made from your your kind of circumstances. And I've also kind of touched on it as to those people that have had difficult upbringings or you know underprivileged upbringings they have a certain kind of drive to better their circumstances and and normally they become kind of you know entrepreneurs and you know I've spoken to quite a few on on this podcast before and I I kind of resonate with some of those things as well I was just wondering what your thoughts are on that yeah, there's certainly all sorts of different elements. Uh, for a lot of people, there's an element of a, you know, an F you, I'll show you kind of thing. Um, I'm not my mom, my dad, my background, my whatever. That k- kind of motivates me and kind of doesn't. Um, and the reason I say that is because I grew up with a lot of just enough. Um, we always, pretty much always had just enough. We had you know, except for the time, well, even when we ended up going to the food bank, we had enough food, um, you know. So that becomes a, a way of being. And so most of my life, as much as I wanted to be aspirational, to build a seven-figure business, it's it was notional. It was more of a should. I don't have kids. I don't have a big attachment to legacy. I don't have a lot of family um, connections. And and so the motivations that motivate people to make money, to be successful, I don't have a lot of those. And so for me, for a long time, um, just getting by was both what I had learned and enough. It was, it was, there wasn't a lot of strong pull beyond that. Yes, I have a strong why, a strong purpose, but it's not about big accomplishments. It's more about making a difference to individuals. Uh, And so I think people get motivated certainly by lots of different things. Um, Most of my resilience and my capacity and my um, kind of depth and breadth came out of overcoming, overcoming and surviving and learning how to deal with really really difficult situations and and i would not change that for the world like people often say would you go back and change it and it's like absolutely not i know i have more depth and capacity than 95 percent of the coaches out there um and i i trust myself to be resilient in any situation and all of that was developed as a result of what i went through wouldn't wish it on anyone else but I wouldn't go back and change it. And and so I think we really need to figure out, are we pulled by possibility, are motivated by the carrot? Are we pushing off of the not enough? Are we motivated by the stick? For me, it's mostly the stick and the survival. And my life's journey has been about going past survival to thriving and figuring out how to make that something that's real, not just a should. And you just said about um, surviving, and obviously survival mode is is difficult um, set of circumstances to be in, and uh, and I imagine it probably feels like just trying to tread water, right? Just trying to um, keep your head above water. Has that ever made you make kind of the wrong decisions and? you know, make decisions that you've kind of later regretted, whether you're like in your career or your personal life or in your business career? Yeah, for sure. I think a lot of the just enoughness um, that I grew up with and got steeped in um, made me a lot more, 
I, I'm pretty bold and I take a lot of risks. Um, and so it didn't necessarily make me more afraid, but it did make me, um, hmm, I want to, I want to say settle for not expect as much, not feel like I perhaps at times was worthy of more. And I think that that kept me playing smaller, smaller than I could and smaller than, than I'm capable of. Um, you know, a lot of, I've been a solopreneur most of my life, um, 40 plus years. I've, I've had, um, variations on the theme and work, but I think a lot of this just enoughness has kept me playing small for a very long time in my life. Even though the, the game I play is bigger than a lot in terms of, you know, uh, reinventing my business. I've been what I call poly homeless, living a mobile lifestyle for 10 years. I've traveled to 33 countries, mostly by myself. You know, I do a lot of things that other people consider to be a pretty amazing life. And for me, I know it's a lot smaller than it could be. So it sounds like you, does it, is that sort of, un, is that slight dis dissatisfaction I can, I can hear there? Yeah, you know. absolutely. And especially now, um, you know, I'm 63, I'm shifting my focus or expanding my focus, narrowing, it depends on how you look at it, to really focus on mature preneurs. And for the first time, Jez, I actually have a why or a, an expression of my why that is um, truly inspiring and pulling me past those limitations. So, you know, like it, growing up with, there's an example. I was driving down the road with my mom in my car and I think it was, I, I think it was my first car and it was a brand new Mazda. I'm driving down the car or down the road and there's a Jag XJS in front of me, a Jaguar car. And I say to my mom, oh, I really want one of those one day. I love the, the lines of that car. And she looks out the window to the right and there's a, a rusted out Pinto. I don't know if you have these cars there, but it, it's a, it was a rusted old yucky car. And she said, well, why do you need that when this will get you from A to B just as well? That's what I grew up with. That's what I got seeped in. Why do you need the best when this second best or third best will do just as well. And so it took a lot of work to overcome that, um, to A, to let it be okay that I want a Jag XJS, to B, uh, not have to settle for less than because for some reason that's what I deserve. And a lot of personal development work, a lot of, you know, personal growth books and reading. I became a facilitator of personal growth courses because, you know, we, we want to solve the problem that we need to solve for ourselves. Um, and, and have done a lot of work on when I work with business owners, most of the work is on the inner game. Most of the work is on our context, I call it the container. So I've been spending a lot of time working on expanding my container and it's only now, now in the last three, five years, that the the reality of going from you know six figures to a million dollars excites me and and is important because I really want to show people who are older it's not too late. You can still be successful and secure and and it's never too late as long as you're on this side of the dirt to make a difference in your life to be able to say yes instead of no and before it was notional now it really motivates me now um you know i'm i'm working on making that leap to business owner from solopreneur to seven figures from six figures because i want to be the example i want to be the poster child of you know, the woman who started at 63 and still managed to make a million dollars by 65 or 66 because there are millions of us who either can't afford to retire or don't want to retire, have another 20, 30 years to go and don't want to spend it knitting or golfing. And so I am motivated like I have never been before in my life because, you know, don't have kids, don't have a husband, don't have a lot of family. There just really wasn't anyone to do it for. And doing it for me never was enough. 
I needed a bigger why. What's click then? What what's kind of changed? Because it sounds like it's been a, a fairly you know recent kind of discovery that actually you want to start being uh, kind of quite ambitious and start being bolder in your goals i suppose yeah what what what's changed there what's shifted it sounds like something has shifted and clicked yeah it is um and and it's amusing because my brand audacity is all about being bold and that that's something that i've been a stand for my whole life um and have been living into but there's a, a difference a qualitative difference to the motivation now um part of it was I finally got, and I'm not sure if it's okay to swear, but I finally got pissed off enough at something personal that, that about the world that, that I could do something about that I cared about doing something about. Um, before that, a lot of it was, again, kind of notional, but I was on the marketers cruise about four or five years ago, a group of marketers from around the world for about 400 of us who come together and network for eight days. And uh, and I was talking to a group of, of men and one of them asked me, what do you do? And mid, I'm answering him mid sentence. He turns and starts talking to someone else. So my first reaction was, well, what a rude dick. And so I mm-hmm. excused myself and went and talked to another group and the same thing happened. There's a group of five people. One, someone asked me, what do you do? Mid sentence. He turns and starts talking to someone else. So I think, okay, well maybe, maybe they're not all dicks. Maybe it's me. Maybe I'm not showing up. So I check in no, I'm usually pretty visible. You know, like I've got polka dot glasses and blue hair. I'm usually pretty visible, pretty loud, pretty present. And um, it's like, no, it's not that. So I started to get curious. What's going on here? And I noticed every single woman who had gray hair was over 60, 50 really, was literally completely invisible and ignored. And I was like, oh, well, I knew ageism was a thing. I just had never experienced it. And and I just got really mad. Like, it was just like, that's just dumb and totally unnecessary and completely inappropriate. And that shit's got to go. And so I got really um, inspired about being about this ism. And it's not the first ism I've, I've dealt with. I would, you know, in corporate, I've literally been denied jobs because of my size uh, you know, I had a 300 pound sales manager tell me that I wasn't credible to talk to his people about sales because I was big. I've had, you know, I've had lots of uh, issues with sexism and sizeism and all sorts of isms. But for some reason, ageism really pissed me off um, even more so. And so it got to the point where it's like, OK, this is this is something that is meaningful to me. It's something that's inspiring to me. It's something that I think is this global phenomenon that's happening right now. There's been a lot of times where I've been on the cusp of a trend and didn't take advantage of it. And like three times, very significant ones. And it's like, I am not doing that again. There are literally more people coming into the business world now than in any other time in history because there's millions of boomers and Gen Xers who are too inspired to retire or can't afford to. And it's the biggest cohort ever in history. They have no support. They're completely invisible and often um, dismissed. And so I aim to change that. So finally, there was a calling that was big enough that intersected with something meaningful and personal to me that for some reason wasn't notional because it's not like there weren't causes in the past that, that I resonated with. But it it was time to step up, step out. So I, I think it was a combination of finally settling into and claiming and owning my own value, uh, having done enough personal growth work and expansion, getting fed up with the solopreneur roller coaster, and really being willing to commit to going past my fears around my capacity to create a business and, in fact, a global movement. And so... It's kind of a perfect storm situation of the outer motivations and the inner readiness. Beyond that, I can't tell you why why now, but all I know is I am super excited to get up in the morning now because I got some work to do. You found your purpose. Yeah. Well, and my purpose has always been, 
um, you know, I want you to get that you matter and live like you do. That's my why. One of my titles is the why whisperer. I support people in figuring out why they do what they do, what their purpose is, and how do they profit from it? How do they monetize that? And, and so why does that matter to me? Because I always wanted to matter. I always wanted to get on the list. Never mind the top of the list. I just wanted to get on the damn list. And growing up, I didn't feel like I mattered. Everything else came first. It, her addictions, men, whatever. They always came first. And so um, I grew up wanting to matter. And that um, translated into a lot of showing up and, and making a difference in a lot of different ways. But now it's really about it's time to make a difference on a big scale. Essentially, you talked about feeling like you didn't matter when you were a child. Because I was going to also ask a se uh, kind of separate question as well about this shift that you've had um, over the last few years. And you mentioned it earlier as well or hinted at it that it was a kind of slight dissatisfaction in, in some parts you know of what you've achieved to you know previously and i was wondering whether you felt that you had a point to prove and you maybe felt you had a point to prove to yourself when you were kind of younger and or you know your your mum not so much mum because mum was always the one saying settle for last um so it wasn't like, look at me, go, mom, I'm, you know, achieving a lot. Aren't you proud? She was prouder when I was just, you know, settling for less and puttering on. Um, and she's been gone for a long time. She was, it was, she, she was a difficult woman. Um, <laughs> that's a mild statement. Um, I think that a lot of it was, um, hmm. I think a lot of it was really the settling became such a way of life that it kept me at the level of being a solopreneur for a long time. And freedom was extremely important to me because we had so many constraints when I was little. So I have lived an amazing life with lots of stories and experiences um, that is a lot about maintaining freedom but often at my financial um, detriment. And so there wasn't a balance in the keeping, my, like I had the life I wanted, but I paid a big price for it. And that's always been a stress and a strain throughout most of my life. And I think a lot of people get results, but they pay big prices for it. And I mean, that was a big lesson I learned young. In fact, it's one of my biggest most limiting lessons, um, a little story that kind of illustrates it is I, my mom's fourth husband was extremely violent, killed his first wife and child, tried to kill us. We escaped, went into hiding. Um, he tracked us down. When we were there, I had, he moved us out to the country so that the police couldn't get called all the time like they were when we lived in the city. And I really, I couldn't have friends over because I never knew what was going on and what was going to erupt. And I begged for a dog. I begged. I was so lonely and so scared. I was seven and and begged for a dog. And I really wanted, for some reason, a miniature collie. Uh, and it was always no, 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 no. So when we escaped, uh, he found us. He tracked us down. One day he got out of the car. I was walking home from school. And he, he almost killed my mother several times. There was tons of violence. And, and he got out of the car. He had this dog in his arms. He came to me. I was terrified. He put the dog in my arm. This little puppy was lifting my face. It was the dog I always wanted. And I so wanted this dog. Like, this was everything to me. And the dog's licking my face. He says to me, if you get your mom to come back to me, you can have the dog. Then he takes the dog, gets in the car. So here I am, this little girl. Obviously, we can't go back to him she's going to get killed. I'm going to perhaps get killed. And at seven, I had to make this heartbreaking choice of, I can't say that to her because God knows she might. And, and so I can't have the dog. And so it, the, the belief that got ingrained at that time, I didn't realize it consciously at the time, but when I look at the wake behind my boat of 
you know, the impact was the belief that I have to pay a big price to get what I want. And that stuck with me my whole life. And I think a lot of people have that belief. We have to pay a big price to get what we want, which makes us really hold back from going for it from because we don't want to pay a big price, right? Even if it's it's often very subtle, it's very subconscious, it's in the background. But that experience really created that or underscored it or deepened that belief. And it's been a problem most of my life because I've had the gas and the brake on a lot because of that one. Wow. I mean, it's obviously uh, a horrific story. And yeah, I absolutely understand why that would have been a, a would have been deeply ingrained in you, right? Particularly, at, uh, you know, at seven, those things don't, you know, don't go away easily. So have you ever paid a big price that you've then looked back on and said, oh, uh, the, that then you, confirms what your limiting belief was? Yeah, for sure. Yep. In the men that I've dated, they've been mostly absent and not, not great situations, either they're kind of half good half bad for me um uh i worked for a large fortune 500 company in canada f um, for a while and literally held down two temporary vice presidents of professional service roles on the east coast and the west coast for a while and and literally went 72 days without a break because of this and worked really hard and made the biggest sale in the company's history 1.2 million dollars while i worked for them and they fired me because they didn't want to pay me the $120,000 in commission and they were having a rough quarter. Um, and it's publicly traded companies, and in particular this company, which had four in-house lawyers and a firm on retainer, would do that kind of thing and force people to litigate to get the money. So um, it, it, that led to two years of depression, bankruptcy, a real struggle getting my business going, a tremendous amount of, of feeling of betrayal and injustice and victimization and so forth. Um, and I'm not a big fan of being in a victim position. I think that that's, you know, incredibly disempowering, but that's how I was feeling for quite a while. And I can tell the story from the victim perspective. I can also tell that story from the accountable perspective of knowing that they had this policy and this habit of firing people if they needed to look good in the quarter and I didn't protect myself, um, you know, things like that. So um, that led to a really difficult period, and it was more than I had ever made. And so the price I had to pay, quote unquote, uh, was being put into a situation of financial duress and hardship because I had achieved financial success and abundance. That kind of, quote unquote, balancing is... I can see a, a lot of it. That was one of the most dramatic and difficult ones. That one, that one was really hard on many, many fronts, and took years to get over. Um, so yes, I've had that impact lots of different areas of my life, and even in my business, like even even now recently, um, finding team and building a team so I can scale the company. Uh, it shows up in terms of of not the right people coming on board, having to, you know, pay lots of money and not get the results, things like that. I can still see the residue of that showing up um, in kind of a habitual way of uh, working really hard and not getting the results. Um, it's not that, you know, that doesn't happen to people. Like, it's not always easy to find and put together the perfect team. Uh, but there is more struggle, I think, in that regard than it needs to be because of that lingering belief. So, yeah, it's still showing up. It's less now. I certainly don't have the dramatic kind of manifestations of it like I have in the past, like when I that whole period um, back in 2000. So it's, thank God, with a lot of work, gotten a lot less, but I still see some of it showing up, paying a price for getting success so i have to be very mindful when things are going well to let that be okay 
and to really attend to. And nope, we don't need to screw it up. And nope, we don't need to undermine this. And yes, it's okay. And just keep going. Um, and being mindful and watching for the sometimes not so subtle sabotages are sometimes very subtle. So, yeah. Yeah, because I was just about to say, you've, you ended up using that word because do you think that you are consciously or unconsciously, I should say, sabotaging or are those things just coming up as problems? And then your narrative in your mind is, oh, that's me screwing this up because of, you know, yeah. because of the, uh, the worthiness or however you, you know, you're deeming it. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Jez, I think it's both. Um, there are times where, you know, a cigar is just a cigar and, uh, you know, a faulty team member is just a faulty team member. It's just not the right fit. There's other times where I can see that it's part of a pattern. It's part of a, um, a theme. Um, and being an entrepreneur is challenging. There are lots of times where there's lots of factors that impact that we don't have control over and that, um, it can be very challenging. It takes a lot of time, takes a lot of per perseverance, can take quite a bit of time, does take a lot of perseverance and commitment. And so it's both. There are times, and that's part of why I have two coaches, is because sometimes I'm too close to it. It's the thing right on the end of our nose, right? And what I, what I, how they help me is they help me pull it back so I can look at it and go, okay, is this part of my my shit that I need to resolve or is this just something going on out there is this something I need to address internally or is this just an external thing okay how do we adjust the procedure or how do we put more of a policy in place around that or you know the practicalities um, and I think that that's a really hard thing I've done you know I've been facilitating personal development workshops and teaching coaching certification programs and that kind of thing for over almost 40 years and I still need help with processing my own stuff because we just can't see our own it's like water to a fish we can't see our own stuff so that's why i still take personal growth courses periodically and have coaches and people who can support me in saying yeah no just it's not about you get on with it yeah no absolutely i, I completely advocate you know that everything you said as well you know being a business person and an entrepreneur um is constant uh firefighting i think um and uh you need the right support in place to be able to get through that and um sometimes it is just having someone there to to vent to really uh -oh. um, and you know that's why coaches and mentors are so fundamental to uh -oh. entrepreneurs and leaders and um ceos etc uh -oh. so I think this kind of leads, this topic of conversation also leads nicely onto the kind of solopreneur kind of failure story that you kind of wanted to, to, to share as well. So let's talk a bit, a little bit about that because I, I you know, I'm definitely seeing uh, that the, some of the limiting beliefs that we've kind of discussed today and you've kind of hinted at it already and how you've been held back in your your business um, or or business ventures along the way. Do you want to say a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think <clears throat> I haven't actually broken it down specifically in my brain before, but I'm I'm going to say that there's three main factors that I think are part of what keep people at the solopreneur level versus building a business. And what I would that leap I'm talking about is basically you are the business versus you make money without you being there. You aren't the primary product in some way. And, and just because you make the leap to being a business still doesn't necessarily mean that you're in the big time. You might still be, you know, running a six figure business or something like that, which is fine. Part of the thing is what is the goal and why does that matter? So like I said before, even though my why was and is that I want to make a difference in the world and I want to get as many people hearing and, and getting that they matter, it wasn't, I didn't have grandiose notions of it has to be a million people. It's just like, you know, that story of the starfish, the young boy throwing the starfish back in the water and the guy saying, what are you doing? There's millions. You can't possibly save them all. 
And he picks up one, throws it back in the water and says, yeah, but I made a difference to that one. That's always been my, my primary motivation. Um, so I think a why, having a why really matters, whatever level you want to play on. There's got to be something that gets us out of bed in the morning. People, human beings are meaning making machines. We need to have some meaning behind what we do, or it just becomes a bunch of shoulds and have tos. And, and most of the time, that's not a very fulfilling life. And, and so I think for me, expanding my why expanded the capacity or the, the level I want to play at expanding it to a, another level for me, another expression of it. Um, I think that there's also an element of support. Um, you know, you can't build a high rise on a trailer pad. They dig big, deep, huge holes for those high rises. The bigger game we want to play, the more support we have to call in. And I got pretty good at calling in support. I even got fairly good at letting it make a difference to me because there's a difference. There's two sides to it, right? But now I'm so willing to call in support and let go of control because growing up with lots of chaos, I came, you know, pretty hunkered down on control. And I think that's one of the big limitations for a lot of solopreneurs. We can't let go of control and therefore we can't let it go bigger than us. So I'm working right now on increasing the support that I have which is a tricky balance because you also have to increase the money you spend for that as well, right? Increasing the support so that I can increase the size of the business and the scale and what we can accomplish and so forth. Um, and uh, so that's one piece is getting over the control stuff and the worthiness to receive the support and let it make a difference. Um, I've worked on that. I think that's kind of in hand. The second piece of that is, like I said, expanding the container. You know, when you bring home those little plants from the garden center and you take them out of the little pots, they're all root bound. When you loosen the roots and put them in a bigger pot, they flourish. I'm in the process of loosening my roots and putting myself in a bigger pot. And I've always kind of struggled with that in terms of, this comes back to that support piece around calling in investors or other people I would be accountable to for, to because that threatens my whole freedom thing that's really important to me. The independence, the freedom, the, uh, you know, own self do. You can't tell me what to do. No, you know. So there needs to be that willingness to expand the container. There needs to be the willingness to call in more support. And <laughs> the willingness to just get over ourselves. So this is a big part of it for me. So those two pieces I've worked on, I think they're pretty well in place. I'm, I'm taking different actions that I have in the past, which is to me, the indicator of if something shifted, are you doing things differently? If not, it hasn't really shifted. Uh, the last one though, is the piece around, and this is where men are a lot better at this than women by and large, is um, just doing it in spite of, or regardless of capacity, capability, is it right? Should I, uh, you know, any of those questions. Um, it's like, you know, I, I'm world-class because I say I'm world-class. That's always been something that has been a no, 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 got to earn it, got to deserve it, incremental step at a time. Let's make it, you know, work really hard to let this be okay. There's a certain degree or uh, time at which you just have to say, okay, I'm going to do things differently, like people who are, you know, at this level of business would do, Regardless, regardless of whether I'm ready, regardless of whether or not it makes sense, regardless of whether or not it's appropriate, I just don't care. I'm just going to do it. And so that's the last piece that I'm putting in place right now, especially around building what I'm calling my maturepreneur empire. You know, I've got a podcast launched. I want to launch a magazine. We're doing a, an event, a big unconvention in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. In the fall, I want to create membership sites, like basically go big really fast and have a really substantive business um, within two years. And I can't do that on my own. So that's where I'm calling in tons of support, partners, even though it still makes my butt go a little tight to say partner. On the other hand, it's also something that is like, there's this whole, the shoulders drop 
when I say partner now instead of, yeah, you know, like I still may get a little habitually kind of uptight, but mostly my shoulders drop because it's like I don't have to do it all myself now. I can play a bigger game and pull in people who are amazing and awesome who also want to be part of this solution. And that's a, that's a contextual shift that took a long time. Um, so I know there's a lot of things in there, but I think our willingness to call in and receive and set up support, our expansion as leaders, um, how big we're willing to be, contextual expansion, I call it, and our willingness to take unreasonable leaps. Those are the three things that I think are really important to make that leap from whatever your version of small is to whatever your version of big is. Doesn't matter what the scale is; it's the same three steps, I think. Yeah, there's. A, I mean, there's a, definitely a lot there to unpack, and it's a kind of. It's a great um, kind of answer. I was just thinking that would make everything you just said would make a, a great blog post or something like that, or a whole episode on, on that subject. Have you got some examples though of where? in your business career where you have been kind of held back and where you have to use your words some earlier kind of played it small mm. and 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 to and you and you use also a nice expression which was had your foot on you know had your foot on the break yeah uh pretty much my entire life yes <laughs> I can, right. so like i've i've had four iterations of my business because every once in a while about every seven years or so i forget and think, ooh, benefits and steady paycheck, and oh, that sounds nice. Or I'll get, you know, in, in cited or induced to come and do some kind of role that is interesting, you know. So, like, I got recruited by that Fortune 500 company to come and do something that hadn't been done. So that appealed to me. So I'll forget and I'll go back into corporate. And I'm there for about two, maximum two and a half years. And then I go, oh, so I remember why I hate this politics and bureaucracy and yes, oh my. And so I leave and go start my business again. So that's why I've had four iterations of it. Um, each time bootstrapped, each time, you know, cash flowed from, from the ground up. And one time it was a marketing agency. One time it was event planning firm. One other time it was a, a marketing training company. And now similar, you know, speaking and training and coaching and consulting on on business development, how to grow your business, how to really get unstuck and actually start making that leap and slightly different but i mean obviously within a marketing context but all, yeah. all slightly different versions of it yeah. so just to, just a follow-up question though where you have gone into those jobs from being and having your um, business have you made a conscious decision to like close the business or has it been an opportunity has come up within the corporate and is it so i'm just is it what's the push and or, or is it a pull is it a pull from the corporate or is it the business pushing you away because it's not working uh it's been both but most of the time it was it's not working so i need to go get work um the pull well no two, two and two actually now that i think back uh, two times it was because there was an opportunity um that was kind of like oh okay let's go this direction. And so I would shut down the business, but it wasn't like any great loss because most of the time it was basically just, I literally was my own boss and I was self-employed and I was making okay money, but probably would have made a lot more had I worked in corporate consistently. Um, and two times it was, this is just not working. I need to go get a job. Um, both of those times, it was... Cause I'm, I'm trying to remember because I, I, that is such a foreign notion to me that I can almost not remember what it was like uh, during either of those times. Uh, That's a foreign notion. The I'm going to quit my business. I'm going to quit and go get a job. Like That's just like horrifying to me <laughs> at this point. Okay. So like literally... I cannot conceive of, of ever doing that again. It could doing a consulting project or something like that, maybe, but going and getting a job, you know, I've learned never to say never, but 
I would be stunned and shocked if I ever actually decided to do that again. Something very, very wrong in the world would have gone on. <laughs> so I um uh so I can't really remember like how I would have got to that point because I am just very determined to make it work, right? And to get things going and so forth. And haven't always been, you know, good at at staying focused on, for instance, on sales. Like I like a lot of entrepreneurs. I love doing the work. I don't necessarily love doing the business. And yes, I've gotten diverse skills over the years. I've been at it for year, 40 years. So I'm, I can do all the components. I still don't like doing most of them. Um, I love doing the work. I love facilitating the courses. I love coaching the people. I love coming up with strategies. I love the vision component. I love launching things. I don't necessarily love getting them across the finish line. Um, well, that and, is a classic uh, entrepreneurial thing, actually. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a, a wonderful book by Barbara Sher. Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a good book, but it's not a wonderful book by Barbara Sher called Refuse to Choose. It's a little hard to find. And she talks about scanners versus delvers. And scanners tend to be, we used to be called Renaissance people, but now we're called flaky. We like to start things, but we, like to, but we don't necessarily like to finish them. We're innovators. We're visionaries. We have books from A to Z topic on our bookshelves. Delvers are the people who love to implement. If you tell a delver to multitask, then they get anxious. If you tell a scanner to pick one thing, they get anxious, right? You need both in the world. And they both have equal value. They just have a different orientation. Many entrepreneurs come out of the realm of being scanners, multifaceted, multi-interest, and they love to start things and and come up with solutions. Many entrepreneurs who are delvers love the implementation of the solution, and they're really motivated by doing that one thing and getting it done. Both have challenges in the entrepreneurial world. Scanners have a big challenge with getting things across the finish line. Delvers have a challenge with being innovative and seeing broad enough to have a real strategic vision that can be myopic. So there's there's challenges on both sides. In her book, she talks about the di difference between the two. And really, um, Scanner's been given a really hard time. And in it, she kind of lets people know that you're not wrong. You just have a different orientation. Many, many entrepreneurs are Scanners. And so they're not wrong for, for struggling with getting things done. They just have a different orientation. They need different systems and approaches and ways of doing things to get it done. So I recommend that book to a lot of people who have been made wrong a lot for how they are. Um, and it doesn't have a lot of concrete strategies for dealing with that. That's why I said it's a good book, but it's not a great book. Um, but I think that that's one of the one of the inherent challenges of being an entrepreneur can be focus. Getting definitely. Done. And you talked about that business. Well, those two businesses you mentioned. You you said, um, well, in fact, in some ways, all four of them, because you, you said two closed because they weren't working, but then you got jobs as well because they weren't working. So really, you know, from can correct me if I'm wrong, there was an element of them all not working what wasn't how are you defining them not working what wasn't working for you well two two weren't working in that i wasn't making enough money to make ends meet and live the way i wanted the other two were working when i was when, went to the corporate jobs i right. was doing fine it wasn't great it wasn't growing but it was yeah. um a, a sustainable self-employment um but that's all it was. It wasn't like I had lots of people that I was employing or anything like that. I had some, some subcontractors, but that was it. So the two that weren't working, basically, I just wasn't making ends meet. And Why do you think that was? Uh, I wasn't doing enough sales. I wasn't focused on the right things. Um, some of it was economy and, and the ripple effect of it. So one of them was during 2008 uh, when there was, you know, the great big kind of market correction, quote unquote. Um, but I think that um, most of it was that I wasn't focused on growth of the business and I wasn't focused on the primary thing that a small business needs, which is sales, consistent sales and marketing. Um, I was resistant to not doing it. And so when you don't do sales, you don't get money in the door and therefore you struggle, right? 
Um, and I think that's for a lot of clients, a lot of entrepreneurs. Almost, almost all of them are have resistance to sales and marketing, self promotion, at some level. Um, it's the degree that they get good at it, and the degree that they overcome that resistance that they can succeed. And um, so, over the years, I've gotten better and better at it, and so it works easier now. And I still go through periods of resistance. And, and in fact, I went through back in May of last year, I called it the great, great shame shit storm of 2023. Um, and interestingly enough, Jez, I had never actually experienced shame up till that point. I experienced a lot of things, but I hadn't experienced shame. And, and I was struggling financially. I was not making the impact in my clients' lives that I thought I should be. Um, I was having personal health stuff some relationships were going sideways and so it was kind of all together and and i just like i had a bout of imposter complex that i haven't had for decades and this experience of shame like i shouldn't be doing what i'm doing um and it was it was difficult the the difference between now and 20 years ago is it lasted three days instead of three months or three years um i called in support immediately well after a day of, of whining and crying and being upset. And I was able to move through it a lot faster because of that support and kind of getting back to center and back to my why and back to who I really am and, and stopping telling the sucky stories of, you know, I suck and I, I have, I haven't made any difference and so forth, which is just not truth, right? It's just not the truth when we look at what is versus the story we're telling. And, and so I think it can happen at any point, no matter what level of success, you know, I've got many millionaire friends, they go through their own versions of that all the time. So successes and, and mm, that sense of being who we want to be gets challenged no matter how much money you have in the bank or don't have in the bank. But yeah. The times that I really struggled the most with my business was when I wasn't doing what I needed to do. And so I was kind of forced to go do something I didn't want to do. Which is kind of back to the thing we were talking about earlier about paying a big price, because you could argue that paying a big price was actually you going back to the, the employment that you didn't actually want to do. And Absolutely. So a huge price. Uh, you're, you're sab in, and I, I, you know, I'm just speculating here. Were you sabotaging yourself by being resistant to the sales and the growth and the things you needed to do in that business yeah, in order to essentially have the, I suppose, the suffering of then having to go back to employment. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because, because you know, at some level, most of us have some version of I'm not enough, some version of I'm not smart enough, good enough, old enough, young enough, skinny enough, whatever it may be playing. It's part of the human condition. <clears throat> and I, and and my version of not enough at that time was I'm not capable of being a successful business person. I can't make money. You know, I grew up with a lot of that kind of stuff and it got real strong at that particular time. And I didn't, like you said, the sabotage was I didn't do what I needed to do to overcome the limiting belief. Um, so yeah, they jumped up, grabbed me and it ended up me being in resistance, not doing what I needed to do. So yes, sabotage and, and yes, you know, beliefs having their way with me, having their, their outcome. But really, I, I think, um, whatever we, whatever we're doing, it's just a need that's trying to be met. And sometimes we meet those needs effectively and sometimes not so much. And and in that case, I wanted to not have to be responsible for generating everything. So I went and got a job so that I didn't have to be responsible for generating everything. Um, yeah, I think there's, there's different times and different motivations in our life. And it's not that jobs are the terrible, terrible things. You know, people are listening to this and they go, but wait, I have a job. It's just not for me. That's for sure. And also, I would say that, you know, that 
because something you could have done as well is you could have worked with someone to you could have got a partner on board for that business to then split some of the responsibilities and they could have done the sales for example did you ever consider that yeah that kind of comes back to that control issue mistrust mistrust of people and their um and and the safety of them uh you know my my mom like i said was married five times all oh, uh, umpteen dozen boyfriends along the way um and I, so I had never really seen any examples of good partnerships, like things working. Um, and I'm not blaming that. I'm just saying that that was not in my frame of reference. So yeah, I had thought of it, but I didn't know whether or not it was possible to create something with someone that I could trust and that they would, and that it would work. Later when it became an option, then it was, am I willing to let go of the control and do that? Um, and that was an issue as well, you know, because, you know, sometimes, and I was arrogant and thought, no, it's got to be my way because um, my way is best. And, and so that's also a limitation. Uh, that's why now the, the older I've gotten, the, the less, hmm, I still think my way is probably the best, but I am willing to entertain other ways now that I wasn't before. So that's why I can call in partners now and loosen up my grip on the need to be in charge all the time. No, definitely, because, you know, and I'm kind of speaking to the audience more than anything as well here is that all you're doing by working on your own in a business is limiting the business's capacity and limiting actually your own capacity and potential as well because you're just holding yourself back and the business back by not by not letting go and uh it, letting go of some of that control as well and and bringing on other people on board because you know i think as entrepreneurs there is a there is a, there is a good belief that we can do lots of things which is which is true um you know, the entrepreneurs then tend to have some self belief behind them as well, which is all good okay. stuff. Yeah. But at the same time, I would say that that can be a negative because I think they, I think entrepreneurs feel like they're superhuman sometimes and that yeah. they have to do everything in a business because I don't know why they think that. Why do they, why, why do entrepreneurs think that? Why, why did you, you know, yeah, some of it is arrogant. Some of it is that I I can do it better than everyone else, and and we probably can initially because we've done it a bunch of times. They haven't. Um, some of it is fear, fear of loss of control, and uh, you know I just kind of made the connection in my head that because I was in charge of my mom, because I was in charge of essentially bringing myself up, I I was doing it alone. I was alone most of my life, and that became that I have to do it myself. I have, you know, and and I can't trust anyone else to do it for me. That was my entire experience growing up. So it makes sense that it would kind of carry on um, and took conscious effort to start to shift that to, I don't have to do it all myself. I am supported by the universe and other people. And yes, I can um, let go and trust that I will be okay. You know, there are times just that I do this little exercise where I get start to get anxious about things and, and oh, I'm not going to be okay. Um, you know, I'm not going to have enough for retirement. I'm not going to be okay in some way, shape, or form. And I go to this website that has calculates the number of days you've been alive. And I literally write the number down on a post-it note and set it up like, you know, 2,300, 647 times I've done the experiment and I've been okay. I've gotten up in the morning and I've fundamentally been okay. It doesn't make sense that 23,648th time, I'm suddenly not going to be okay. Get a grip. If you did an experiment this many times and you got the same result, chances are very good. It's still going to be okay tomorrow. So sometimes I do that literally to get myself to like stop being an idiot about things. But it's a great, it's a, there's a, a nice little trick i, I yeah. think for getting some perspective as well do you think that those two businesses were that weren't 
uh, making ends meet that you had to kind of close and get a job. If you had got brought partners on board or if you had brought staff on board to grow or to do the things that you didn't want to do, the sales, for example, do you think they would have succeeded? Um, well, the staff was an issue because there wasn't enough money to hire staff. It's one of those chicken and egg things, right, that, that uh, entrepreneurs often struggle with. Partners, um, could they have? Yes. Had I found the right partner and that was aligned with whatever the growth strategy was for the business at the mm. time? Yes. Could it have succeeded in reality? So theoretically, yes. In reality, probably not because I don't think I was mature enough to actually partner with someone, um, you know, whether that's personally or professionally at that time. I didn't really know what it meant to be a partner. So it probably wouldn't have worked very well, or we would have really had to, like, I would have had to learn fast. What does it mean to actually be a partner? Because that's not just about having someone else in the business. It's about understanding strengths. It's understanding collaboration. It's about letting go of control. It's about surrender. It's about trust. It's about commitment to having this other person's back. It's about getting out beyond yourself to now it's a we like there is a lot of differences between being on your own and having a partner that's more than just oh someone does have to work now and so would that have worked back then probably not in theory would it have been a good solution absolutely is it a good solution now i hope so because that's i'm putting all my chips behind that so yes do I still know how to partner? No, not really, but I'm going to find out and I'm willing to do the work to to learn how to do it well. And when I bring partners in, we're going to have that conversation around, look, I don't have a good track history with this. I don't have a lot of history of being married successfully or doing, you know, like being in a long-term relationship. Um, so you're going to need to teach me and we're going to need to work on this together. But I'm, I'm very willing to do that now because I'm really committed to playing that bigger game. Do you think that those businesses had um, good enough um, like product or business models to grow to the levels that you wanted to at the time? Yeah, yeah. I think any business, almost almost any business can grow or be grown. I mean, one was a marketing agency and one was a um, event planning firm. And, and both of them could have grown bigger. Um, with the right business model and did I know the business model? Yes. Was I willing to do the things to expand the business model at that time? No, because that's part of that is bringing in team, bringing in partnership, bringing, mm. making a bigger structure in general. Um, so yes, for sure. There's very few businesses I think in the world that can't be grown, can't be made bigger, stronger scale, you know, if they want to. Not everybody does, but if they want to, yeah. What do you think moves the needle on that? What do you think um, makes some businesses succeed and others not? Occasionally, it's external factors. COVID put a lot of businesses under because um, they didn't pivot. A lot of businesses grew during COVID. A lot of businesses pivoted and, and carried on. Um you know, so there are external factors that certainly have an impact. But what's the difference between those that pivoted and carried on and those that went under? I would say vision on the part of the um, owner. Resilience in the form of willingness to change and shift. Like I did a lot of training during that period for, for business owners on how to pivot and how to think about things differently, about how to reimagine a future, how to get let go of what you're invested in and it looking a certain way and being willing to look at maybe we get there a whole different way than we ever thought. Um, I think resistance to change keeps a lot of people locked in to a particular path or notion. Um, and leaders, so there's a big difference between a leader and a business owner. A business owner is someone who has a business that operates a certain way. A leader is someone who has a vision and the business just happens to accomplish that vision in this way right now. And that's not the same thing. Leaders can shift. Business owners often can't. 
And so I think that there's that. There's also, I call it a money set point. There, you know, when I'm working with clients, I'll ask them, what's the most you've ever made in your life? That's their current money set point. Until they expand their context around what's okay to have, they can't go further. They can't make more money. It's like, I don't know what the the mechanical thing on the car is, but it's like a regulator or something. It can't go faster than that piece of equipment will let it go because it's got that limitation to it. So the same thing with money, money, you know, if people can't conceive of, that's why most people who win millions of dollars in, well, actually every person typically is back at the same level of earnings that they were before or worse within five years of winning a million dollars or more. They've done statistical analysis because they haven't changed their context. Because that's a limiting belief as well, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. This is this is how much it's okay for me to have. Yeah. You know, and whether it's I can't make more than my dad or, you know, money's evil or whatever the story is that's going on, that needs to change in order for the company to get bigger. Which is, which is the piece around, um, you know, like when you listen to Richard Branson or read his, his biographies and so forth, he he didn't have a lot of um he had a lot of no in terms of his life and what's possible and he came from lots of limitations and lack he didn't have a lot of yes as in oh this is possible and i'm going to be a millionaire that wasn't his his driver he had a lot of i'm just going to say yes to this thing i want to do and that happens to generate millions of dollars mm. I'm going to be a rebel and in the process of being the rebel. And that was what I was talking about earlier. Just do it. Be unreasonable. He, he was a very unreasonable and is a very unreasonable human being. He just says, I think I can do this. So is Elon Musk. Musk. So is Steve Jobs. I'm going to do this thing. And they go do it. And it happens to create millions of dollars. But that wasn't what pulled them. That wasn't what, you know, the people who set out to make millions of dollars. Can you? Yes. Is it um, sustainable? Not for most. Most of them end up losing it. Trump's a good example. Made and lost millions and millions of dollars. Yeah, it reminds me of, uh, I don't know if you've read the book, The Big Leap by Gay Hendricks. It, it's, um, that, that book keeps coming up in my mind throughout this conversation. He, he, he talks about um, limiting beliefs in that, and he has a whole, he mentions about lottery winners and um, lots of great other great examples of people self-sabotaging uh, uh, unconsciously self-sabotaging and he calls it an upper limit problem and it's essentially what you said that mm -hmm. people feel they consciously can only go to a certain level and then if they go above that level they find some way of pulling themselves below yeah uh, you know the, the level they've set for themselves which um yeah it's a kind of fascinating uh concept and he's got lots of um examples of you know celebrities doing that as as um for example mm -hmm. Just thinking about this solo entrepreneur thing and 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 how you know playing small and 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 having the break on and things and looking back and using all of that kind of experience that you've got of that now, what advice would you give to people that are in that situation now as entrepreneurs? Mm. Um, a couple of things. One is get really clear. Do you actually want to play a bigger game? And by the way, thanks for that book. I'm going to go get it. I like Gay Hendricks. I haven't heard of that one. So um, do you actually want to play a bigger game or is it somebody else's should going on in your head? Um, just because the voice is in your head doesn't mean it's your own. So I would get real clear on, um, is this your dream? If so, or your why or your purpose or whatever you want to call, whatever you're motivated by if so, and and there is a genuine choose to, want to versus have to or need to, then I would say um, those three things I mentioned before, support, context, and willingness to leap have to be in place um, to be successful at it. It's not about, because um, there's been a lot of times I've taken runs at it. But one of those three wasn't in place, or maybe two of the three weren't in place. And if I look back in hindsight, I can see that now. There also needs to be, I think, the biggest piece of advice I would give is commit and recommit and recommit. 
commitment trumps competence. Commitment trumps um, pretty much any obstacle you can ever come up against. And until we go all in, like 99% is really hard. Going 99% of the way is having the gas and the brake on. And even if you only got the brake on that 1%, it's still enough to burn the car out. So go all in and, and commit. And we sometimes forget and the commitment fades and it gets difficult. And so recommit. If it's important, it's important enough to recommit. That's what I would say. All those other things are helpful and in place. And without that fundamental willingness to, to continue to do that, you won't last. And do you think that's the same advice that you'd give to people who might be um, scared of failing and therefore they are either not starting their business or they're doing what we've been talking about today which is having a business but then not pushing it to the next level do you think that is fear of failure and if so would your advice be the same uh no i think it'd be a little bit different in that situation because if it's a fear of failure that's stopping people or a fear of success because it's one or the other typically um or fear of the unknown or whatever but that comes down to one of the two um uh, what I would say is there, they need to turn up the why, the volume on the why to drown out the, the volume on the fear. Um, <clears throat> that until there is a why that's compelling enough to get you to take action, you won't. Sometimes that requires continuing to put a grain of sand and a grain of sand and a grain of sand until it tips. Or you can just get really intentional and put a boulder on there and have it tip, you know, now versus later. But until you can figure out what that boulder is for you, um, it won't tip. And until it does, the fear will keep you out of taking action, either consciously or unconsciously. It doesn't mean that we don't act without fear. Like I act, you know, courage isn't the absence of fear. It's the willingness to take action anyways. And so those people who are afraid of starting, A, tell a better story because you're telling sucky stories right now about, oh my God, this will do this and then this will fail. And then, then I'm going to become homeless in a street, you know, street person, tell better stories to be, find the way to create courage. And I've got it like a process and the process comes a lot back to calling in support, turning up the volume on your purpose or your why and, and getting a, a stronger, um, get someone to push you out of the nest, basically gets, get that push or pull turned up volume, the volume on it. Um, so I think it's a, it's a little bit different. It is more about how do you get past that so that you can get into action than it is about the committing to coming back and coming back and coming back. No, that's great um, advice. And I really like the phrase you use, actually, fear of success, because um, that is that, you know, again, that's kind of a limit that's around that limit in belief, isn't it? And the stories that you yeah. tell yourself that you're not good enough for that success, basically. Well, yes. Or sometimes it's, you know, there's a lot of people that come up with um, kind of an unconscious fear of success. Like if I make more money than my dad, then I'm kind of betraying him if they're, mm -hmm. you know, like a daddy's girl. Or I can't make more money than my family or they won't still love me because now I'm, you know, putting on airs or whatever. There's a lot of stuff that, or, or, you know, if you grew up in a family where rich people were bad or evil or vilified, well, you don't want to become that, right? So there's a lot of people who have a fear of success because they will become something they don't want to become or because other people will reject them because of who they are. And our belonging needs are really, really important to us. So we'll do a lot to avoid being rejected, including playing small and not being successful. Lots to think about there. Mm -hmm. But just wrapping up, and final question. If you could go back in time and erase those four businesses from not closing so they they succeeded, would, you know, and essentially that means you haven't failed, mm -hmm. would you do that? Hmm. Well, you know, like I said earlier, I wouldn't go back and change any of the experiences I grew up with because it created in me a capacity that I wouldn't have and that most people don't have. 
Um, and, and that's been very helpful and handy in my life for me and for other people. Um, I would like to, I, I'd probably say something very similar. I learned something from every one of those situations. I learned something about what not to do. I learned something about myself. I learned something about business in every one of those situations. Um, could I have learned those lessons other ways that perhaps weren't quite as difficult? Probably. I would also have loved to have learned, like had the experience of growing my own business bigger than I did. I've grown lots of other people's businesses past seven figures and so on. So I know how to do that. I haven't done it for me yet. So that's why I'm excited about doing that now because um, it's, it's time and I haven't had that experience yet. Would I have changed it? Probably not because each of those lessons, however hard won, um, I think, you know, I would take the school of hard knocks over getting a degree any day. Uh, because I think it's far more applicable than the theoretical information you get when you get a degree. Um, and on the other hand, it would have been nice to have one really grow and have that experience earlier. Um, and it didn't happen. So it's going to now. I know I didn't answer your question really very clearly, but no, no, you have, did. a tough one. It's a really tough one. And by and large, I would say no, because I wouldn't be who I am and I wouldn't know what I know. And who knows what you need to know from the past, uh, that if you erased it, you that might have been just the very thing that you need to succeed. Absolutely. And it, it will be, you know, great to do, you know, a follow-up episode in five years when you've got this big brand of, uh, and then you can reflect back about actually... Uh, I reflect more on your journey as exactly. to here's the success from, you know, from those, the ashes of those businesses that, that didn't kind of work out. Exactly. And here's the struggles along the way with building this one. And um, here's the difference that it makes to be able to say, yes, it did achieve this level uh, yeah. versus the other levels. Um, not, neither is right or wrong, but they are very different. So I am looking forward to the, to the new experience. Amazing. So we always end on a quick fire round. So this is short questions and short answers. So question one, failure is. Oh, first thing that came to mind was inevitable. What's your life's mission? To support as many people in getting that they matter and living like they do as possible. What's one piece of advice you'd want to give to other people on your deathbed? Um, you must live a story life. It was a piece of advice I got from a Korean gentleman. And when we die, we don't take anything with us except the stories we've lived. So you might as well live an exciting, interesting story. Uh, that's, that's a great quote. What's one habit that keeps you resilient? Choosing to spend time with friends so that I get my cup filled. Nice. If you could be immortal and live forever, would you take it? Absolutely. I love this life. I love learning and growing. I love seeing changes that have happened over the 63 years I've been here. I can't wait to see what happens the next couple hundred in a heartbeat. What's one surprising fact that not many people know about you? Hmm. I'm pretty much an open book, so lots of people know lots about me. I would say they don't know. A lot of people don't get the the depth of me and breadth of me right away. And I think that um, sometimes that's image, sometimes that's that I kind of do da-da-da-da-da-da to distract them from it. Um, I, something that people don't know about me is that I'm actually not really very good at intimacy. I'm very good at being an open book, but I'm not actually very good at intimacy. Okay. That's a whole separate podcast in itself. Oh. Um, and last question, who could you recommend as you think that I should have them as a guest? Oh, well, if you could have anyone, I'd listen to Richard Branson. And um, I I know so many cool people. Um, Ashton Applewhite. Uh, I just had her on my podcast. She wrote the book, This Chair Rocks, a Manifesto Against Ageism. She's intelligent. She's 
passionate. She's uh, super informed and she is on fire about shifting our world. Great. I will look into Aston. So Jeanette, where can people find you and connect with you? Um, so most social media, bodacity.ca is my website, B-O-D-A-C-I-T-Y.ca and Jeanette, J-A-N-N-E-T-T-E at bodacity.ca. Um, you can check out my podcast, the Purpose and Profit Sisterhood podcast or the Maturepreneur podcast. Um, but yeah, so I'm kind of over all over a lot of different social medias, um, Join me in the Purpose and Profit Sisterhood Facebook group. Um, Just send up smoke signals and we will meet somewhere in the ether and somewhere in the world when we're supposed to. Brilliant. I will put all those links in the show notes. So, Jeanette, thank you so much for being here. I've um, really enjoyed this conversation. I've loved some of the analogies uh, and your way of articulating things. So um, thank you for that. I've got lots of great quotes um, Mm -hmm. that I've got written down here. So um, thank you for that. And yeah, thanks for your time and and for being here. Thanks, Jez. I really appreciate you holding a space for people to have a conversation around what doesn't work because there's a lot of putting shiny, bright faces on a lot of things, especially in business or leaders. And and so holding space for people to go deeper and tell the truth is a really, really big gift that you give people. So thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for that. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Fail. Really hope you enjoyed this episode and learned something new. Please do subscribe to the show and leave us a review. It really does help us to grow and to reach more people. Do follow us on social media too. We're at Jeswood on Instagram and at Beyond the Fail on YouTube and also on Linktree. Thanks again and see you soon.